Extraordinary Life Stories is proudly sponsored by the Georgia Emerson Centre. Hello, my name is John Reynolds. On this episode of Extraordinary Life Stories, I'm talking with celebrity osteopath Nadia Alibi. Nadia has over 20 years experience and is the founder and principal osteopath of Back to Wellbeing, a multidisciplinary healthcare clinic in London. Nadia shares her experience of breaking through glass ceilings and taboo as a woman leading the way in osteopathy. Early on in her journey, she was told, you don't look like an osteopath. And now she regularly appears on our televisions on this morning. Her relatability and passion for helping people is inspiring and much needed with over 10 million people suffering from back pain in the UK. I am really looking forward to talking with Nadia. So tell me, who is Nadia Alibi? So I'm an osteopath, I'm a mum, and I'm also a clinic owner. And as well as that, I do TV and radio where I spread a lot more news and information about how you can look after yourself and your health. Amazing. What did a young Nadia want to do when you were growing up? Do you know, honestly, I don't really know. When I think back, I, I remember holding my mum's brush and trying to present. I, I, it was one of my things. I loved presenting and introducing people on shows. But I also loved helping people. Yeah. And I remember once, years ago, I had an, a lady saying to me, oh, you'd be a really good doctor. And I knew I wanted to do something where I could make people feel better. And then when I was 10, I was in school and all of a sudden I just lost my eyesight. Um, and both my eyes, I couldn't see a thing. Everything went pitch black. No out warning. Of the blue. No warning. And back, you know, they had those desks which you lift up. And yeah. I literally stuck my head in there and I closed it over. And I didn't know what to do. I was panicked, a 10 year old child. And uh, my friend came over to my desk and she said, what's going on? And I said, I can't see. So she took me to the teacher and they called my mum. And my mum took me to the GP and the doctor there said, Oh, she's suffering a migraine attack. I think it's her long hair. I think she chopped her hair off. And he gave me these tablets to take home. So my mum had to like guide me home. And at this point, the blindness has now gone into flashing lights. And I got home and I took these pills and I felt awful. And it took days for this to subside. So literally, I would be feeling pain. I would be not see. I couldn't see I lots of visual disturbance. I'd feel nausea. I'd want to vomit. And all I could really do is lie there because everything hurts. I couldn't even cry because of the pain. Um, and it was at this point what I started doing is I started touching points on my face. And I thought, oh, hold on, if I'm touching under my eyebrow, I can actually see. So what's, what, what's going on here? So I started touching points on my face and I started to realize, actually, I'm feeling better. If I put my finger right at the base, I can, I can actually see. I can, the pain is going, I can breathe better. So I started to, at that point, I was a bit, I was really curious into natural ways of healing, natural ways of feeling better, because when I would take these tablets, they didn't really do anything. I would, I would just feel numb and groggy. Yeah. So that's where it started. I was really intrigued with um, helping people. I was intrigued in natural ways of helping people. Sure. And um, I then stumbled across, uh, across something called naturopathic medicine. And I thought, right, I want to be a naturopath. And I went to the university um, for an interview, as you do. And um, the lecturer said, hey, why, would you, why don't you mix up naturopathic medicine with osteopathic medicine? And I said, what's that? I didn't, you know, osteopathy wasn't a big thing then. It was more about physiotherapy. Right. So I looked into it and I thought, oh, this sounds really interesting, you know, structure, motion, we can, you know, working with the two together. Mm. Um, and I had really bad posture. I used to play the trombone. Okay. So as a 10 year old, I'd play it and I'd have this big rucksack and I'd be quite hunched. I was really hunched as a child. Yeah, and, um, big heavy instrument. Yes, but I'd also have like encyclopedias in my rucksack. I, yeah. was, I was the geek. And um, so I would read every book you could read. And now at this point, I'm thinking, hold on, an osteopath and my posture is not really that great but let's do this. I was now, you know, I'd taken a year off after my A-levels. I was about 19 and I went in and did this a four-year degree. 
And during this time is when I started to learn about how realigning makes you feel. I haven't suffered a migraine for 20 years now because I'm so much better in myself. I've learned to understand my body better. I find we are always our best fixers. Yeah. And if we can learn how to, if we can listen to our body when it speaks, mm. that's when it all connects. Just bear in mind, you could have spent a lifetime on pills. And, many and I imagine do. you don't even take them anymore. I don't, no, I don't. And I have lots of patients that will come in to see me because they suffer from migraines and they'll come in saying, I suffer, I've suffered most of my life and this is once a week and I take this, that, that and I just want to stop because I feel terrible. Yeah. And that's when, you know, just realize, looking at their body, if you start lifting things, stretching things, you're increasing the blood supply, looking around tension areas, around the mouth, releasing all of that, it makes such a difference. Is there one major kind of common denominator where people are coming to you or in your profession where people are suffering from something that is kind of the overall number one kind of thing that you, that, you know, migraines or sitting badly from so, work? Is there one thing that dominates? So there used problem? to be, it used to be back pain, lower back pain. Now I find it's mixing up. There's a mixture of lower back pain, mm. but I'm getting so let's say 20 years ago, yeah. I'd have people that were sort of in their 40s onwards that come in to see an osteopath. Now I'm seeing people as young as their 20s because there's so many people working from home, yeah. right? So working from home, you may not have the right work ergonomics. You may just be working from your bed with a laptop and that's causing a lot more rounding. With that, people are on Zoom meetings, there's social media. You know, you can get a photo of yourself in a second, as opposed to back in the day, you go yeah. and get the film reel. Yeah, so it's changing and people are more aware of, oh, I'm looking a bit slouched. My head is a bit too far forward. Oh, my neck doesn't show. Mm. So all of that, I feel, is changing the way it is. So right now, in, in particular, posture is one of the things people come in for, but also tension in their spine. So actually, there's two things there, because with posture, an 11 and 13-year-old, two daughters, who um, are using the phone a lot more than I would like, no matter how much my wife and I try. I and, yeah. and so the stance is, is that. And yes. they could be there for a long time without them even necessarily realising they ticked off or what have yeah. you. Yeah. So is that something, because uh, we weren't doing that. I wasn't doing that and when I was I growing see, up, right? Yeah. Is that going to cause problems with kids now, much earlier into their sort of 20s, 30s? Is that something that's... I say yes. Um, so if we think about the head, the head weighs approximately five kilos, right? So yeah. the skull. Now... Think about the little vertebrae. So you've got seven vertebrae in your neck. Mm. So imagine a fishing rod, rod and the head's dropping forward and these vertebrae are trying to pull you back. Sure. But if the muscles at the back of your neck aren't very strong and you're always looking down, the head plus gravity is going to be pulling. So what eventually happens is you're noticing people are more here than here. Yeah, so, I feel like I can sit up straight. But it's also about how you sit. So when people sit, for example, you'll sit on your bum mm -hmm. as opposed to your sitting bones. And what I say to people, and I say, don't do this then in front of your work colleagues, but grab one butt cheek, pull it aside, try it. And grab the other, pull it aside, and you'll feel these like knobbly bones. Do you feel the yeah. bones? Right, those are your sitting bones. So those are the bones that you should actually be sitting on. Right. Um, things like a saddle stool, have you heard of that? No. So a saddle stool, it's almost like a horse saddle. Yeah. It makes you naturally sit on your sitting bones as opposed to going to work and pulling, pulling. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. it's a great way to make sure that you're upright and it just makes it easier. Sitting on a hard seat like this, a yeah. hard surface also helps. So if you're sitting on a soft sofa or a soft mattress, yeah. you'll naturally want to sink into it, right? So doing something like this on a hard, on a hard surface will yeah. keep you upright. But going back to the TVs and the iPads, yeah. This looking down is going to happen. You know, it's very, I have a five and a seven year old. And one of the tips I give them is either bend your knees up and prop it up. So you want it as close to eye level as you can get or get some cushions. So if I see them on their iPads, I just get cushions, load it up. Yeah. And then I get it up and I just say, hold it at an angle. And it makes such a difference. That's Sit back and hold it at an angle. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be going home to it and that straight away. <laughs> the other thing you mentioned was the tension, yeah. which um, something that I've I've always felt, you know, I've always tried to keep fit. And, and any one time I hurt myself water skiing, for example, oh, when I was in my late teens and I hurt my lower back, yeah. that's when I went to see an osteopath mm -hmm. because I was physically injured. But the tension that you're talking about comes from mental, mental yes, stress, right? right? A lot. And we you're seeing a lot of that. To, yeah, anxiety, so much. Stress. Anxiety, 
anxiety is one. So with anxiety, a lot of times people breathe from here as opposed to the yep. diaphragm, right? So there's a lot happening here. If, you, mm. if, if, if you've had, ever had a panic attack or had an anxiety attack, it's more of a, you know, stress, yeah. all of that's here. You'll see people weighing their shoulders up as their earrings because it's all here. And it's really about trying to drop it down, trying to take the breathing lower down. Sure. Um, but I do find emotional stress um, can really build in the shoulders. Interesting. So yeah. so that, go back to that question a little bit earlier where the most kind of common things, that's a big thing at the moment, is it? It's huge. And yeah, I find I'm... also as well as this area, the jaw, you know, when you're tense, you it's almost like you just close it up here. So there's a lot of times patients will come in and I start to release muscle tissues and then I'll get some gloves on and I go inside their mouth and I'll say, just give me a thumbs up if it's uncomfortable and they'll be there and there'll be tears streaming down and I'll just, I'll say, are you okay? And they'll say, no, it's just a lot of emotions have just come to the surface of things I've been holding on to. Yes. And it releases and you just notice the body just kind of goes into jelly and just totally lets go. And I think we hold on to a lot, past memories, things that haven't made us happy. Yeah. And it's just about allowing the body to release it all. Oh, it's amazing what you're doing. Are there people do you think that should be coming to you, need treatment, but actually they think it's not for me or I don't need that or you know I can't afford it, whatever it might be. Do you think there's people that are suffering almost in silence? Absolutely. And I mean, this is one of the reasons I took to social media because I found it was my way of giving. It was my way of providing information for people that can't actually come into That's me. Um, so for me, it's a way that I can, someone who's got low back pain, what do I do? Here you go, here's the stretches. Someone who has a scoliosis, can this be helped? Here's some before and afters of what I did, but here is what you can do from home to help with this and help ease this. So yeah. it's for me providing help to people for them and just tips, little tips. Mm. And I think they can just make such a difference to people's actual lifestyle and quality of life. Yeah, I love that. Extraordinary Life Stories is proudly sponsored by the Georgia Emerson Center. Introducing the Georgia Emerson Center, where innovation meets health. If you are tired of waiting for a diagnosis or believe there should be other ways to treat your condition, the Georgia Emerson Center could help you. We take a patient first approach and offer the latest medications and technological advancements in private healthcare across a number of key areas, including but not limited to headaches, migraines and chronic pain, mental health conditions, addiction and ADHD diagnosis and treatment. We have an on-site lab for diagnostics to enable you to receive health assessments on your terms and in your timelines. From our state-of-the-art clinic in central London, our consultants want to help you improve your quality of life and access to affordable healthcare services. Take back control of your health at the Georgia Emerson Centre. Extraordinary Life Stories is proudly sponsored by the Georgia Emerson Centre. My wife actually is a reflexologist. Is she? Oh yes. my God, I did reflexology. I oh, love brilliant. that. So, yeah. um, and I, I know from her point of view that she, she before children in particular, she yeah. was prolific, very busy. Um, but one of the things I remember was she went into re reflexology because of how much she liked having it. Does someone give you osteopathy? Do you, yes, do you, do you know what I mean? Because it's so easy to kind of, yeah. So within so you my keep clinic, that going yourself. absolutely. I yeah. have some amazing practitioners within my clinic, and um, I, 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 for me, maintenance is key. It's almost like getting your car MOT'd. You need to get your body MOT'd. You can change your car. Mm -hmm whenever you want, but you can't change your body. So it's about servicing it throughout. Um, I get myself MOT'd. There's times that I have no issues or no problems or no aches or pains, but it's just come check me, what's going on? You know, I've, I've been, I stand a lot and I, I'm, I'm doing lots of leaning forward. I don't want to end up ruining my posture or my joints through it. Mm. So it's really about helping all of that. Yeah. And actually following that, so, so for us, a lot of that's from a physical point of view. Um, there's so many things you can do now from breathing exercises to um, meditation to going to the gym. What yeah. works for you? What, what are the things that you swear by? I'm a mixture of it. So I like to box. Um, so I t like to release my stress mm. that way. But I find recently, I just don't feel I love boxing so much. And I tend to play with it. So through the, through the seasons, it changes. I tend to go, I play with yoga at some stage. Yeah. I will go for reformer Pilates. I will box. 
I will run. Um, I What I do love to do is the breathing techniques before I sleep. So I'm one of those people that at the end of the day, once I've come home and I've seen all my patients that have yeah. come and told me everything and I just want to release a lot of that so I can go in the next day fresh. Um, you know, I like to end my day with things like salt, magnesium, salt baths, mm. and I light some candles. And that just to me is when I close that door, it's my time. It's where I can now allow myself to also heal because listening to people and helping people can all, you can also take quite a bit on yourself. And, you yeah. know, I need to make sure that I'm looking after my mental health. So for me, that's one of the things that I do to just start to relax my body. And then after that, I'll go into bed and I'll do some breathing techniques. Mm. And that to me is my form of meditation. But as well as that, do you know what I love doing, John? I love going for long walks. I'm a country nature person. So I, love, that too. I love it. Just the sound mm. of the birds, yep. um, the green, the colors. You know, I'll take my sunglasses off. I don't, I've stopped wearing sunglasses mainly because I want to... Um, It's, it's all to do with the hormones and the melatonin. So I want to take it in through my eyes. But yeah. colours... Especially I, in this country, especially exactly, in the UK. Right? Exactly. But I think colours are so important. So when you go into a park, rather than wearing your sunglasses and seeing everything as dark, take them off, look at the skies, look at the green, look at the daffodils. And I think that's so uplifting. Oh, so I crave it. Yes. Yeah, um, especially being in London, I actually live down in the New Forest and yeah. I can't oh, wait to get back amazing. and then just get out and, and yes. do a workout outside or whatever it yes. might be. Yes, because it's yeah. also grounding and it's connecting. Yeah. It's your time where, although you're walking and you're moving, because I also mm. think people think meditation is like crossing your legs and chanting Om, but I think it's being with yourself. So yeah. just going for a walk where you can kind of get lost and yeah. just be in yeah. that moment. And actually, precious. you get your thoughts, you, as you see, you sort of decompress, but also then things that you might have compartmentalized or forgotten about, they come back to you. And I think if you don't take a break, and I think it's brilliant, you do make the time for yourself. You know, you, you just build up more and more yeah, stress. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of people won't give themselves that time. And of course, you're a mum, busy with the business and the media. Yeah. How do you how do you juggle that side of things? Because you know that's not easy for everyone. So, and I, uh, this is where I mean I'm a Libra, so balance to me is everything. So if I if I start to tip, that's when I it's it's game over. So for me, it's organization. Like I have to make sure from because I know Monday through to Thursday, it's clinic, it's TV, it's radio, it's newspapers, magazines. So that's that's that end. So that's Nadia, the osteopath, and then there's Mummy where I need to make sure that the meals are made, the laundry's yeah. done, the house is clean, the homework's done. So it's all for me, if if I haven't prepared for my week, I find on a Sunday, I kind of start meal prepping. I start prepping everything that I'm doing. So I, that's how I get my balance yeah. with doing the two. But then as well as that, that's when I have to have time for myself. So I have to de-stress through the hot bath, through the walks. And sometimes I don't have time for going for walks. So I'll just pick up the phone and I'll speak to a friend. Mm. And it's just a way of clarifying my thoughts through the day. And it's bouncing off each other. And I just find that that is releasing, finding ways to release yeah. things that we're holding on to. Take me back to when you were qualified yep. and breaking into setting up your own clinic or working for someone else. Yeah. Take me through that, that journey. Well, that was that was a really interesting one. Um, so I came out of university and um, I was so excited to get out there. I just thought, right, I want to work as an associate. I really want to learn more. And um, back in the days, you remember there were yellow pages. I opened the big yellow pages and I marked down every osteopath there was. And I called each one because my dad's like, when are you going to get a job? Why are you still sat at home? So I called each one and I get called in for mm. um, interviews. And um, I go in really excited and I, it'd be literally seconds of me walking in and sitting down and I'd get a, ah, oh, I don't look like an osteopath. And I, I would think, what does this mean? Yeah. And um, I had a lady say, oh, you look like you should be in the fashion industry. What made you choose osteopathy? So I'm trying to sell myself as in I really do care for people. Um, and I'd always get a no, sorry, you know, I don't think you're suited. And I remember going to um, one practitioner who lifted my hand. He lifted my hand and my wrist and he said, these aren't hands of an osteopath. Did you really go into the right profession? Did you think about this? Wow. And I was getting so disheartened. And I was going home. Did it make you more determined? Oh, it made me so <laughs> determined. Did I need to ask? 
it was then I said, right, you know what? I've, I've called every osteopath in the yellow pages and no one wants to give me a job here, there. So what am I going to do next? I've got my dad badgering on saying, why are you still at home? When are you moving out? And I thought, right, I'm going to start my own practice. And at that point, I thought, right. So I started calling different places and I found this amazing luxury gym. And I thought, how am I going to fit in here? You know, I was like 23. And um, I popped in and they said, look, we have a room to rent. So you could rent a room in this gym and you could start off. And I said, okay, um, here we go. And I went and made some leaflets by hand and yep. I put them in the letter boxes of all the surrounding people, the surrounding streets. And I went in and I felt so positive when I went in. I said, you know what? I'm going to go in. I'm going to make a difference. Well done, you. And I did it. And I went in and... Um, there was no one in my diary and as people coming in, I was just introducing myself saying, this is what I do. How about you come in for a free spinal check? And by two weeks, I was fully booked. Wow, well done you. Yeah, that, it was incredible. Story. And I felt, it was like for me, it was one of those things that it was surreal because a month ago, I'm being told you're in the wrong profession. You shouldn't have done this. And a month later, I, because I feel it was, I was so dis- I wasn't having it. No. I wasn't having it. I no. said, right, I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. And I did. And um, so that's when I started and I, I fell in love with treating. Mm. I fell in love with it because you have people coming in and they have so much that they really want you to help with. And once you start to make that difference and you could see it in people and the that when someone comes in with a walking stick and they leave without it. Oh, that's satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. It was lovely. So talk me through from what you're you're now set up successful, the media. How did the media come about? Because what I love, what I love uh, is that uh, that classic kind of old git that sort of says, are you sure you've chosen the right profession? Well, he's not on TV. He's not on the BBC radio. Um, (laughs) Uh, So uh, it's you. But but how did you you. make that happen? Um, So firstly... I, I kind of was slow and, slow and steady with my clinical practice. Mm. I enjoyed working in clinic. Um, I traveled to Canada. Um, in Canada, in Toronto, osteopathy was not very known. So I said, right, I'm going to make a difference. And I went into a boutique gym and there was a chiropractor and a physio. And I said, right, I'm going to be an osteopath. And I worked there for about eight months and it was fully booked by the time I left. And I said, right, I have to leave now. I'm going back to London. Um, my mother had sadly been diagnosed with breast cancer. So I came back to London. And um, at that point, I had two little, I had my little girl, my, 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 who's now my eldest. And then I had a second daughter too. So I had them two years apart. And at that point, I thought, okay, maybe this is my time to start to kind of, push like slow it down maybe I need to um just focus on motherhood and just being at home and I I started doing that so I three months after giving birth I thought right you know I'm just going to be at home and I felt that there was something missing I loved being a mum I love being a mum but there was some part of me that I wasn't able to help others I I love teaching people how to care for themselves and be pain-free and at that point, I said, right, I'm going to slowly start to work, go back into work. And then COVID happened. So the lockdown happened. Sure. And my youngest at this point was two years old. And me being a key worker um, and their dad was now working from home. It, I was like, right, you're working from home. The kids are with you. I have patients that are on waiting lists to see me. I'm going to increase the time I'm working. So I started to increase the time I'm working. And all of a sudden, this room that I'm renting within a space um, was not enough. But, and you, you, out of a tough situation, right? You know, COVID was, 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 was difficult for anyone that was physically practicing and needing to see people. It was you, so hard. You, turned, but you turned you know, a difficult situation into uh, a positive one. You know, Thank an you. amazing outcome. Thank you. And then, and then, just quickly, so from a media point of view, so yeah. you, you, you know, actually going on the TV and being yeah. being the person that is, yeah. um, you know, being asked the questions in front of millions of people. How did that happen? That was actually it was really interesting. I was with a patient, and um, I kept seeing my phone going off, and you know, treating my patient. And when I went on my lunch break, I went to my phone, and I had um, a voice bell saying, you know, hello, I'm calling you from blah blah show we would love to have you on the show and I thought this isn't real I just ignored it 
I then had this number calling again. So I call, I picked it up and they said, you know, we'd love to have you on the show. And I said, so how do you know about me? And they said, oh, we've seen your profile. And I'm like, where? Where have you yeah, seen yeah, me? Because yeah. I just thought this, you know, and then they, they'd, they'd gone onto my website and they'd found me on my socials and they wanted me on the show. And it was, it was really exciting. And then from there, I was, you know, called by BBC Radio London as well. And it's just been very organic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It feels like it's a, a, almost a bud. Wait, I, yeah, yeah, it's about the bloom, right? Because you're feel uh, that. a lot of people are talking about you and uh, what what you do and how you do it. Which the marriage is fantastic, and and there's millions of people. Did I read somewhere there's like 10 million people in the UK that plus that yeah. suffer from? Yeah, I mean that's just Back one pain part in of what you're uh, absolutely. Helping with and that. I think the difference with being on being in media is you're able to reach out to more people. So when I'm one-to-one -one with a patient in a room, it's me and that patient. But once I go on radio or I go on TV, there's a lot more people out there that are being helped. And that can take, it's that one little tip. There might be a little sentence I, I put in and that resonates. Yeah. And that sentence is going to actually help them yeah. on you know feeling better about themselves and being pain-free. Yeah, and honestly, whether it's being dad to two amazing daughters or or just the fact that i've got a real craving to learn you know that's what you know i'm we doing with you, you now <laughs> and then anyone watching ultimately is learning so much from it so uh, yeah. i'd love to ask you what what's your greatest strength that i care i think it's um I'm, I'm, I'm passionate as an osteopath, but I think the difference is, is that I, I want to make the difference. I care that patient to me is an individual. You're not just a patient that's walked in through the door. Mm. And I feel that that to me, the fact that I care and I'm able to, I want to know why this has happened. I think that makes it slightly different as to how I treat. That's a great strength. And what about your greatest weakness? My greatest weakness is also my strength. So I think the yeah. fact that I care so much, um, there's a lot of times, you know, I will, I, I feel it. So, you know, if I have patients that are going through stuff, you know, I'm doing everything I can to help them, but I will leave clinics sometimes just feeling that. And I just feel like I wish I could just fix it completely for them. So I think it's sometimes that I might care too much. No, I get that. But can you care too much? No, I think, yeah. it's, I think it's a good thing. Makes you, it's like you say, it flips it into it, it makes you good yeah. at what you do. It just I makes you a passionate that. person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And someone um, watching you, whether that, or flip it as a younger version of yourself growing up and some of the things you, you've, you've gone through, what advice would you give to someone coming through as an aspiring entrepreneur and potentially a female as well? What advice would you give I would say give continue, that, looking back? continue to believe in yourself. Yeah. I think it's all about... Um, there's going to be lots of noise. There's going to be lots of people saying you can't. And if you believe you can do it, you just go. You don't think about how you're going to do it. You don't think about the whole staircase. Just think about that first step in front of you and take it one step at a time. But it's like, it's, it's about believing in yourself and going with your, going with that gut. I love that. Nadia, I've learned so much just from Aww. talking to you today. It's Thank been you. incredible. Thank you so much for Thank coming you. on the programme. Extraordinary Life Stories is proudly sponsored by the Georgia Emerson Centre. Introducing the Georgia Emerson Centre, where innovation meets health. If you are tired of waiting for a diagnosis or believe there should be other ways to treat your condition, the Georgia Emerson Centre could help you. We take a patient-first approach and offer the latest medications and technological advancements in private healthcare across a number of key areas, including but not limited to headaches, migraines and chronic pain, mental health conditions, addiction and ADHD diagnosis and treatment. We have an on-site lab for diagnostics to enable you to receive health assessments on your terms and in your timelines. From our state-of-the-art clinic in central London, our consultants want to help you improve your quality of life and access to affordable healthcare services. Take back control of your health at the Georgia Emerson Centre.